This is what's happening at The Rock. Grace and peace, freedom, family, and friends. These are your midweek announcements. We still recommend that you wear your mask, but it is not mandatory. We will continue to monitor the COVID numbers and will make adjustments accordingly. We have resumed baby dedications here at Freedom Rock. If you desire to have your child dedicated, please contact the church office. Dancing for a Cause is being held this Friday at the Temple Theater Ballroom. Doors open at 6.30 and the event begins at 7. Tickets are $50 and you can see Shamika Blakeney or call the number on your screen if you are interested in buying a ticket. Seating is limited, so get your tickets today. Bishop Hedgeman will return from his sabbatical on Resurrection Sunday, which is next Sunday, April 9th. Once again, Bishop Hedgeman will return from his sabbatical on Resurrection Sunday, so get ready for a powerful word from heaven. The Covering Celebration, honoring 12 years of service by Bishop LeBaron Hedgeman, is being held this Sunday during morning worship service. Guest speaker for the event is Pastor Henry D. Leonard Sr. And we are asking for members to sow a seed of $100 or give their best gift. If giving online, we ask that you give under C and put celebration in the memo line. Senior Members Connect will host Bingo with Bishop next Tuesday, April 4th, beginning at 5.30 p.m. here at Freedom Rock. Bingo with Bishop is for seniors ages 60 and above. We look forward to seeing you. The nursery has reopened. Children ages six months to five years pre-K are welcome to attend. And if you're interested in volunteering, please contact our connection team leader, Angela Winston, for more details. The Ministry of Care will meet every fourth Monday at 6 p.m. via Zoom. Elder Cedric Dubos is your connection team leader. If you have a birthday, an anniversary, or you would just like to give someone a shout out, Send us your email to freedomrock at frcfc.org. And for birthdays and anniversaries, make sure to list the first and last name as well as the date. These have been your midweek announcements, and we are asking you to keep all announcements in mind and be reminded that Freedom Rock Cathedral is locally committed and globally commissioned. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. We give God glory on tonight. Come on, stand to your feet. Hallelujah. As we enter into praise and worship tonight. Hallelujah. Grace and peace unto you at home tonight. Somebody just go ahead and start worshiping the Lord. Hallelujah. There's nobody like the Lord in all the earth. Hallelujah. There's nobody like our God in all the earth. Come on, just worship the Lord. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We honor you tonight. We give you glory tonight. Hallelujah, Father. There's nobody, 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 nobody like our God. Hallelujah. Come on, lift your worship in this place tonight. Hallelujah. Come on, lift your worship in this place tonight. Hallelujah. God, we give you all tonight, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here we go. Oh, oh, oh Lord, our God, how excellent is your name. Your name is strength. Your name is power. A strong tower yeah, makes me say. How excellent is your name. Hallelujah. Your name is sweet. Your name is power. A strong tower makes me say. Nobody like you. 
Come on and raise it. Come on, raise it. You are our healer tonight. There's nobody like you tonight, God. And we trust the very plans that you have for our lives. Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together as we welcome Minister Tom and Winston to the stage tonight. Come on. Oh, hallelujah. You know that there is nobody like the Lord. Go ahead and give God a hand clap of praise right there. For I remember a song sir said one time that he searched the world all over and he still couldn't find nobody, nobody greater, greater than our God. So we give glory now and honor to our Lord. Certainly we first and foremost honor and acknowledge God the Father the Godhead three in one God the Father our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit for his presence that's already with us on this evening glory to God we want to certainly honor our pastor our uh, our certainly our leader uh, the one who leads us in faith and leads us in truth and teaches us and guides us in all things in the earth our own Bishop Hedgeman. Let's go ahead and give Bishop Hedgeman a hand clap of praise. Certainly, we honor Bishop. Uh, I 
don't take for granted being asked to stand in the stead of such an awesome leader to do what God has called me to do. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be before you on today. Uh, I can't promise how long we'll be, but we're going to say what God told me to say, and I'm going to go sit down. Uh, as a reminder, we're praying that everyone is carrying out their prayer assignment with true love and dedication. Let's make sure we're lifting up this amazing family in prayer as God is working through them as they are working to transition our beautiful sister as she is uh, going to be with the Lord. We believe by faith what the Bible says, that we will see her again. Uh, this is not a death, no, it's, a, it's just a sleep. So there will be a great awakening and we will see her again. Glory to God. Glory to God. So we're excited about that. Well, there is a word from the Lord. I may not be bishop, but I do hear from him. Uh, and we're going to believe, God, that there is a word for the people. Our scriptural text will be the same text bishop has been working uh, for the last month. Uh, we're going to use John chapter 13, verses uh, 34 through 35. John chapter 13. Verses 34 through 35. John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35 for our scriptural text. And the word of the Lord reads, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that ye may also love one another. By this, the word declares, shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Our text this evening, we're going to use uh, our text here, we're going to use for a scripture topic, Lord, prepare me to be an offering. Lord, prepare me to be an offering. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much now that your word is true, God. There is nothing about you that can fail, God. So we thank you by faith that we know you have sent your word, God. So now I pray, allow the anointing to fall fresh in this place on this your servant. Have your way, oh God. Use me for your ministering needs, God. I pray now that the Holy Ghost bears witness with every word that is said so your people will receive, God. We thank you now that the word goes forth unhindered, God, so that everything that is heard and said shall be used for your glory and for our benefit. God, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Lord, prepare me to be an offering. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We certainly honor our online uh, guests that are with us as well on today and all of our guests that are present with us in person. Um, the whole month of February, Bishop is doing an amazing job of presenting to us a series topic called The Offering. So Bishop has been doing an amazing job of unlocking and unraveling the understandings of what it means to be an offering. Not so much just to give an offering, changing our mindset as it relates to what an offering truly is. Not, not just something I give out of my pocket, no, but the goal is to learn to be an offering. Uh, he's done an amazing job highlighting some things that I just want to re-put in your hearing so that these are things that we're ensuring that you are still doing. Bishop told us that the offering is the undeniable evidence of love. When we're walking in the form of an offering, it is the undeniable evidence that we're walking in love. He also told us that it's the love of God in us that makes us an offering to others. Yeah, this isn't something I do in my own power, not something I do in my own spirit, not something that I do in my own self. But this has to be enabled through the power of God operating in my life. So it is the love of God in me that helps to make me an offering. He went on to say that disciples are not known for who they like but they're known for how they love. Woo! Boy, that was good to me. That right there was worth a shout of nobody but me and Jesus. 
he says, disciples are not known for who they like, but they're known by how they love. Then he went on to teach us exactly how to define this biblical love that we're being called to. He said, biblical love is the decision to compassionately, responsibly, and righteously pursue the well-being of another. So he gave us some great clarity on what it truly means to be an offering, to walk out the assignment that's on our lives as we are called to be an offering. And my assignment here on today is not to reteach what Bishop has already done, but my assignment here on today is to help to make sure that the information that we have been hearing begins to move from just information to application and from application to implementation. So my assignment today is to make sure that this word that we've been hearing, we start to put legs and action to what we've been declaring. And I believe by faith that the Holy Ghost has shared with me that when we learn to put action to the faith that we're believing God for, the Lord says he's ready to begin to shift your current situation to your desired destiny because of your obedience to this word. I don't know how many of you aren't at pleased with the situation you're in or you're looking for God to make a change to exactly where you are. But he says this word will be the deed seed needed, just as Bishop said, to help to shift your life into what God is calling you to be. The Lord says your next level, your next location, your held up harvest is all bound into your operating in this word and walking it out. So it's essential that we're here on today to make sure that we're not just having information, but we're walking out implementation. The difference between information and implementation, information comes in and it goes out and it's never processed. When it's going into implementation, that means it becomes a part of my daily DNA. So when I'm implementing something, it's a part of who I am every day. When you wake up in the morning and you brush your teeth, that's a part of an implementation. You know your teeth will fall out if you don't brush them. When you wake up in the morning, you take a bath. You implement that because you understand the body doesn't need to smell like yesterday. So we need to take this word from just being something we hear, information, to being something we're walking out every day, implementation. And that's what the word is for today. That's what God is preparing us to do today, to understand how to be the offering he's called us to be. Whether we know it or not, or whether we understand it or not, this series is one of the most important series Bishop has ever taught as a part of this church history. I know it may not seem like it because it doesn't house words like blessed, and favor, and supernatural, God do it, anointing, fall fresh. Oh, my life has changed instantly. No, but it is the quintessential need of every believer to learn how to walk in love. Love walk is so important. Paul dedicated a whole chapter to it almost in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is so important that it is something that Jesus called on us to make sure we were walking out all of the time while he was here on the earth. Even as he prepared to leave, he wanted to make sure we were walking out the understanding of what it means to have a love walk or to be an offering. Being an offering is so important to the believer that this is what the Lord said to me like this. He said, um, if we're going to be known as Christ's disciples, it's going to be because of how we love. He says, our love walk must become our logo as a disciple. So just like things that you wear have logos and they're easily identifiable, that's the way our love walk has to become as it relates to how we're walking with one another. Just like you're able to see a logo and you, it pops instantly into your head exactly what you're seeing. You go, man, I know exactly what that is. Miss Kim, let's, let's try this. Let's see if we, if we can identify some logos really quickly, if you don't mind. So our love walk has to become our logo as a disciple. So this is a logo. Anybody in the, in the audience know what this is? Shout it out. 
Jordan brand. All right. Look at that logo. Picked up on it quick. All right. Let's do the next one, Miss Kim. What is this one? Nike. Just do it. All you see is a swoosh. No name, no trademark, no words. Just a swoosh. You know the logo. All right. Let's try this last one, if you don't mind. This one's for the ladies. Look at God. Oh, man. Every lady in here like, yeah, Lord. Okay. So, uh, just like we have recognition of logos that we saw there, so should we be identifiable by our love walk as Christians. People who know us should be like, man, when they see a picture of us or they see us coming or they are having discussions about us, they should say, man, that's a Christ servant who has a great love walk. If that's not what's being reported about us, then we're missing it somewhere. We're dropping the ball on God in the form of our love walk. But God has sent me here today to help us find out what we need to do. So again, it, it should be as recognizable as a brand logo. Any logo that you have, our love walk should be just as recognizable. Uh, understand this about the love walk. It's so important that Jesus said, outside of our relationship in worshiping the Father, the next greatest thing we can have in the earth is a love one for another. Not just in this text, but he said it multiple times. Go with me to Matthew twenty-two thirty-six. Matthew twenty-two thirty-six, Because Jesus repeats some of the similar concepts even when he is teaching here. So we'll go to Matthew twenty-two thirty-six. We'll read it out of the New Living Translation. I like the New Living I'll set it up as we're getting there. So Jesus here has just got through uh, talking bad to the, uh, to the Sadducees. They tried to trap Jesus as always. They're trying to catch him up with some language and some wording. And Jesus as always uh, is very cunning, very understanding, very wise, very knowledgeable, never is trapped up by them. Uh, and now the Pharisees are walking up and they hear how Jesus has just dispatched their brothers. And now they're going, wait, 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 wait. I think I can ask him a question that'll trip him up. And so the Sadducee, verse 34, begins to ask Jesus a question. He says that, he says, but when the Pharisees had heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they met together to question him again. See, they keep coming back for torture. One of them, an expert in the religious law, one translation said he's a lawyer, loves to ask questions, loves to try to trap people up. Uh, they tried to trap him with a question. They said, teacher. Which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Now watch this, because he didn't stop there. He says a second and equally important. Means he keep this on the same plane with how we love walk with God. He says... Uh, that you love your neighbor as yourself. He says the entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So what Jesus is saying is that we understand that we have a Deca law in the law of Moses. It's not just 10 commandments. It's 10 versions of commandments that he gave. Jesus said, I don't have to waste time trying to remember all of these commandments. Lord, did I break number two or did I break number 312 or did I break number 107? He says, if we just learn to walk in love, prioritize my love walk with the Father and prioritize my love walk with each other, he says all of the things that are required of us in the Old Testament will be met. So he lets us know that it is essential to us that we learn how to walk in love with one another. John continues this same thought that Jesus taught us when he starts to teach about love walk in 1 John chapter 3 probably one of the most valuable chapters if you're interested in learning how to walk in love with each other. 1 John chapter 3. Let's go there. We'll start reading at verse number 11. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. We will stay in the New Living. It's relevant. 
So John is teaching us just how valuable our love walk is. He's continuing the same teachings that Jesus taught us so that we won't forget the value of walking in love or being an offering one to another. Uh, so 1 John chapter 3, verse number 11. 1 John 3, 11 is the text. So John is trying to teach us here what it means to truly walk in love. And the Bible reads, this is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Don't miss that. He says, we must not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. And why did he kill him? Because Cain had been doing what was evil, and his brother had been doing what was righteous. So don't be surprised, dear brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. Oh, that's good to know that. You won't be loved by everybody. Thank God that he loves us. He says, if we love our brothers and sisters who are believers, don't miss this part. He says, it proves that we have passed from death into life. John tells us, this is so important. He says, this is how we know we have been converted from death into life. It's not because of me coming down and handing the preacher my hand. It's not because of me praying a prayer. It's not because of me sowing a seed or praise or worshiping or speaking in tongues. He said, I know that I have eternal salvation based on how I love one another. My love walk determines if I have transitioned from death into life. It's the foundational principle to let me know God, I'm walking in life that you have called me to walk in. This is an essential principle. But he didn't stop there. I love that. He says, uh, he went on to keep going, verse 15. He says, anyone who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. My God. He likened hate to murder. Great day almighty. He says, anyone who hates someone, that's likened to a murderer at our heart. He says, and you know that murderers don't have eternal life within them. So just in case you were unclear on what I was saying just a minute ago, this clarifies it for you. Eternal life is on the line based on how you are walking out this love walk. It's not something we can take for granted. If it's something we just feel like we don't have to do or we can do it selectively or we can do it when we want to do it or we're not doing it as God is calling us to do, my eternal salvation is on the line if I'm not walking out this love walk Christ has called me to walk out. He then says in verse 16, I love this, he says, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. Mm, that's good. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brother and sisters. So some translation um, teach us that this word give up actually means to lay down our life for our brothers and sisters. Now, what is this text telling you? Does it mean that you need to die for somebody so that you can prove you love them? No, that's not what this is saying by no stretch. Christ died so that we don't have to. We don't have to give our lives in death. That's not what Christ is calling us to do, and that's not what John is teaching us to do. But he is telling us that this laying down our lives is akin to the word sacrifice. Sacrifice. No, it's not lying down my life in death, but it is giving up my life in some way in the form of sacrifice. When I say I'm not going to do certain things or I'm not going to go through with certain things because even though they are things I want to do or I feel like I need to do or things I don't want to do, because I love Jesus and I'm called to lay down my life for my brother, I am willing to sacrifice. Some things are going to be inconvenient. Some things are not going to be in my preference. Some things are not my desire. But yet and still, I have to walk them out because they are pleasing to God. Sometimes you'll be called upon to do things that you just don't want to do. 
co-worker may be on their way home. you just getting off and you have somewhere to go. You want to try to get by the grocery. You want to cook dinner. You're trying to do right and eat better and take care of your family. You see your co-worker, they're leaving out. They wave and they're walking and you say, hey, where's your car? Oh, man, my car in the shop. I don't have it. What do we want to do there? It's not my preference to want to take you home, but I need to lay down my life in that moment in the form of a sacrifice. Your spouse is asking you to go the extra mile and do some things to help out. I need to lay down my life. I need to sacrifice. Children need you to do certain things. They want you to take off work to attend programs or be there for certain events that they're having. I have to make it my business to lay down my life in the form of a sacrifice, irregardless of how I feel, irregardless of if my emotions want to do it, it's my responsibility to walk out this love offering for the people God has called me to do it with. So it's our responsibility, irregardless of whether we like it or not, it's our responsibility to be an offering. Now, here's where the Holy Ghost challenged me the most. And man, this was good to me. I hope this is good to you. It was good to me. Here's what the Holy Ghost said to me while I was in prayer for this. He said, uh, most times we define our love walk or our being an offering to a person based on things that we do to them or with them in a face-to-face -face setting. So if I asked you, when was the last time you were an offering to someone? You probably are going to quote some face-to-face -face setting. Most likely, I would. I would have until the Holy Ghost uh, showed me this. Face-to-face uh, -face setting. So we're going to think about activities we've done or things we've done or words we've said or being there in person to make sure things were done well. We want to quote activities that are done face-to-face. -face. But here's what the Holy Ghost said to me that I thought. He said, oftentimes, people will omit or forego our love walk or how we see being an offering when the activities happens behind the person's back. Mm. He said it this way, what we do or say or allow to be done or said about somebody in settings where we can control the narrative it's just as much about being a love offering as what we do or say to them face to face. So if I'm mishandling the relationship uh, behind somebody's back, then that's just as much as me not being an offering as it would be me foregoing something that they need me to do when I'm in their face. So how I handle people, even when I'm not in their presence, determine if I am truly mastering being an offering. You need scripture on that. I know, whoo, that's uncomfortable. I felt the whole room go dark. That's okay. Jesus loves you. Go to Leviticus chapter 19 because you need to see this. Leviticus chapter 19. We're going to do this in the Amplified. Verse number 15. Because what I do or say when I'm not in their presence, it's just as much about my love walk as when I'm in their presence. Leviticus chapter 19, we're going to start at verse number 15, and we'll do this in the Amplified Version. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 15. The Bible says, and you shall do no injustice in judging a case. Uh, somebody comes to you with information. They're asking you what you think about it. You want to make sure it's not unjust. You want to hear both sides. You're doing it right. It says you, sh you shall not be partial to the poor, meaning the only people I care about are poor people, but I could care less or I really despise people who God has blessed to have prosperity. He says, or show preference to the mighty, meaning I kick poor people and folks that don't matter in the face, but I'm down on bending knee trying to help out people that I think are important in name and title. He said, don't do that either. He says, but in righteousness and according to the merits of the case, judge your neighbor. Now, this is the verse that I love. Don't miss this one. He says, you shall not go up and down as a dispenser of gossip. Oh, I like that. Dispenser of gossip. You know, church people have their own way of being gossipers. 
They don't just gossip directly to you. They come to you and go, you know, we need to pray for such and such. And then they wait for you to go, oh, what's wrong with, oh, let me tell you, child, let me, let me. See, now, dispenser of gossip. <laughs> Keep it to yourself. The Lord knows. People come to me and try to tell me, folks, hey, we need to pray for so-and-so. Let's do it right here, right on the spot. You don't want to know? No, the Lord knows. Ain't no distance in the spirit. I don't need to know what's going on. The Lord knows. You ain't trapping me in that. No, Lord, uh-uh. I'm not going to be a dispenser of gossip. He says, don't do that. And he says, and scandal. Gossip is just as bad as scandal. Ooh, let me tell you what's on the deal. Ooh, Lord Jesus, scandalous. No, no, we don't do that. No, no, no. He says, nor shall you secure yourself by either false testimony or by silence. Oh, that's a good one. Because sometimes we believe that as long as I don't say anything, then I'm still in the right by listening to what is being said. But the Bible tells me that if I am not careful, my silence is just as dangerous as the word from somebody who is speaking dysfunction. I need to be careful how I handle even when I'm not in somebody's presence. Oh, boy, that's a holy place. Therefore, repentance, I believe God is ready to change. Some, I told you, destiny is being delivered tonight. Once we start to master this word, there might be somebody in this place who say, man, that's me. Holy Ghost, I repent. I know it's me. He says we don't want to secure ourselves either with false testimony, meaning I'm saying something that isn't true. I'm agreeing what the, what the people are saying. Or I refuse to say anything at all, knowing I know better. He says, we shouldn't do this because it endangers the life of my neighbor. For I am the Lord. So this isn't Winston's decide. This is what the Lord has said. So how I handle or mishandle people, even when they're in or out of my presence, still is an indication of how my love walk is actually functioning, not just for me, but in the eyes of the Lord. Because we have to always know God is watching. I don't care if you believe it or not, God is always watching. God always hears. God always knows. God is not nonchalant. He is not slack. God always knows. And he hears what we say. Boy, you need text on that. Let's give you some text on that just in case you feel like Winston's lying there. That God's not paying attention to stuff I say. It don't really matter what I say or do. Winston, God's going to love me anyway. High five, God. We friends. Okay. Here's what the Bible says. Go to Numbers chapter 12. Let's, let's, let's deal with Numbers 12. Because sometimes we need to see the side of God that isn't always merciful. Sometimes we forget that God is a righteous judge. Yes, he is merciful, loving, and kind. But for as merciful, loving, and kind as he is, he's also holy, righteous, and just. And he will not miss when it comes to delving out how we mishandle people even when it's not in their presence. Numbers chapter 12, let's, let's read this out of the message because we need to see this. This is, this is good. Uh, the Bible says Miriam and Aaron, in case you don't know who these people are, this is Moses' brother and sister. So he's a natural brother and sister. Aaron is his real natural brother. Miriam is his real natural sister. Bible says Miriam and Abram talked, Miriam and Aaron talked against Moses. How did they do it? Behind his back. So Moses didn't even know what was going on. Moses still being kind. Moses trying to help him. Hey, let me fix your breakfast. Let me help you out. Let me pray to God about you. And yet behind their back, they're carving Moses up and not believing it's ever going to come back. But hang on. Let's, let's see how this goes. Say, they were talking against Moses behind his back because Moses married a black woman. Now, you got to study the region this is in. Cush is from the same today as it was even in biblical time. The people who live in Cush are folks that look like you and me. They black people. So they're mad at, at Moses because Moses took on him a black wife. Black coffee, no sugar, no cream. Moses found him a woman that looked like 
She was a Nubian princess. And they are hot. Shocks, Moses. I can't believe you went and got a wife that don't look nothing like what we look like. Can't believe it. Bible says he married this Cushite woman, and now they're mad at him. They said, is it only through Moses that God speaks? Surely doesn't he also speak through us? We get the same message Moses is getting. What? We, we don't need this Moses. We he married this woman we don't even like. We, no, man, we don't have to listen to Moses. Moses is not that important. So keep reading. The Bible says, and God overheard their talk. Oh, man, you need to tell that to one of your neighbors. Say, neighbor, I don't know if you know it, but God still hears. My God, that's a good word for somebody. The Bible says, now the man Moses was humble uh, more than any man in the earth. Uh, the Bible says that God then all of a sudden called Aaron, Moses, and Miriam out to the front of the tent of meetings. And God descended in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent. And he called them out And uh, when he said, listen to this. He said, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. If there be a prophet of God amongst you, I make myself known in his visions. I speak to him in dreams. But I don't do it that way with my servant Moses. Man, you got to hear that. It says, I speak to him intimately and in person. See, God checked them for their dishonor of Moses, even though it was done behind their back. So we got to be careful how we handle people, even when we're not in their presence. The Bible says when you go on to read uh, Numbers 12 all the way out, that he struck Miriam with leprosy. And it was Moses, the one she was hot at, the one she was mad that his wife didn't look like her. Old brown skinned pretty woman. She didn't like it. So now it's Moses who has to lay hands and calls for her to be healed. How many of our sicknesses are tied to words that we've uttered against people not thinking God didn't have ears to hear? Whose hands is God saying, I need them to lay hands on you with an apology out of your mouth before I begin to heal your broken body? Is there anybody here that can be honest and say, God, this word is for me? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. So we got to be careful how we handle people even when they're not in our presence because that's just as much as offering as if we are seeing them face to face. So how do we walk this out, Winston? How do we, how do we get to the point where we are being an offering? How do, we, how do we be what God is calling us to be in this area? What do we need to do? Uh, how do we get to the place where we're saying it's no longer just information, but it's being implementation that we're walking this out? It's a part of my daily DNA. I'm changing who I am every day because I want to see all God has for me as it relates to my destiny. Well, if that's you, you're in the right place because we're going to teach you some basics to help you see your life implemented in this way. If we're going to walk out this word, the one thing we must be as an offering is be prepared. Be prepared. Not just prepared in the sense that I know something is coming and now I'm ready for it, but prepared as in on the front end, allowing God to minister through me so that I'm ready even before the event comes. We got to learn how to be prepared. Every form of offering Bishop taught about is a form of offering that has to be strategically prepared. He talked about the guilt offering, the sin offering. He talked about the burnt offering. All of these Old Testament type offerings and all of them were strategic and prepared. None of them did people just lob to the priest and just hope they were right. No, they, they weighed the grain. They made sure that everything matched exactly what it should be. When they brought a lamb, they made sure it was spotless without any dysfunctions or any brokenness. They made sure that everything they did was prepared. 
even when God sent Jesus as an offering for us, it wasn't done haphazardly. He was a prepared offering for us. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 10, 4, he says the blood of bulls and goats can no longer be the, the payment for sin. He says, so the Father has prepared me a body. So it wasn't by mistake, it wasn't by error. Jesus was a prepared offering for our sins. So nothing about what Christ has done or what God does is lacking preparation. So if we're going to be the offering God has called us to be, we have to be prepared. So how is it that I get myself prepared? I'm glad you asked. The one thing we must do if we're going to be prepared as an offering, we need to learn to gird ourselves in word and in worship. We got to learn how to gird ourselves in word and worship. I can remember when I was a kid, my grandmother used to always fuss at my cousins and my mother and other women that would come by the house, and she would always look at them and say, girl, you need on a girdle. She fussed at them, you, Lord, you need a girdle on. And I never understood what a girdle was for, and I wanted to ask, grandma, what is a girdle? She said, boy, a girdle has specific jobs. It's either to help make sure things are pulled in, or things are held up. So anytime there's a girdle, its job is to make sure things are pulled in or held up. So if we're going to be prepared as an offering, we need to gird ourselves in worship and in word. So why do I need both of those? I'm glad you asked. Worship has the amazing ability to move me from where I am into the presence of God. Boy, I'm trying to tell you, there's no better place that you can be on this side of heaven than in the presence of God where there is need or necessity of him. Boy, I tell you what, there's no better place. If I can find myself and just get into his presence, things begin to change. Earth begins to shift. My emotions begin to be seated. My disposition begins to improve. I find myself in a place where my hands are lifted even though I came in with a heavy heart because I find myself in a place where worship is now where I'm girded with. You don't believe it? Go to Psalm 16, verse number 7. Psalm 16, verse 7. Jesus, I need to be girded. Psalm 16, verse number 7. Mm, mm, mm. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I need to be girded, Lord. Gird me in your word and in your worship. Psalm 16, verse number 7. Psalm 16, verse number 7. And the Bible reads there, um, if you're reading in different texts, uh, the, the King James Version says, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in thy season. Uh, you read it in the, uh, in, the, in the Amplified Version. It says the same thing. I will bless the Lord. He has given me counsel. Yes, my heart instructs me in the night season. Now that word bless there, even though it's written as bless, when you study this word out, in the Hebrew, it's more likened to the word worship. It's a bow down, humble submission to God where I give everything I have to be in his presence. He says, when I find myself in worship, then I can begin to hear his counsel. But he's very specific about the counsel that he hears. Keep reading down to verse number 11. Uh, uh, let's start at verse 10. Verse number 10, let's go to the Amplified. He says, for you will not abandon me to show the place of the dead, neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruptions. Then this is what I love about learning to have worship. He says, you will show me the path of life, for in your presence is the fullness of joy. I don't know if you've ever had God 
pour into you joy when everything in you said it was unjoyful, where it's been hurt and pain and dysfunction and the world has eaten you up and people have taken advantage of you and nothing about your life seems to be moving in the direction that you felt like God should be navigating it and you go into prayer and you find yourself in worship and you get before the Lord and you're trying to get before him to tell him your heart's desire and yet all you come out with is joy. You don't have an answer. You don't have a change. Your situation is still the same but the difference is in his presence he filled you with joy and now the joy you goes back into the situation and changes it the way God wanted you to originally. That's nothing but the power of God. Sometimes he's not going to pull us out of everything. Sometimes he wants to plant us in some stuff so that our joy that he has put in us through our persistence of being in his presence can change the whole situation. Then he'll begin to hear our prayers and hear us when he decides to shift us to different states. But it takes being filled with his joy. And I don't get that unless I'm girded in worship. The next things I need to be girded in is God's word. The reason I need God's word is because his word reminds me of his promises. And if I can't stand on nothing else in this world, I can stand on God's promises. You hear me? If you can't stand on anything else in this world, you feel like everything is sinking sand and nothing has its hold on truth. You can stand on God's word and give his word back to him and watch him change your situation and do things that will blow your mind. So I have to get in God's presence because I need to stand on his word. If you don't believe it, uh, write down Mark 10, 29 through 31. We won't turn there for time. But the Bible says uh, he was talking to the disciples uh, and they were uh, complaining because they said, all that we have done for you, we got we to gotta read this. Give me just a second if y'all don't mind. Give me one second. You, you have to see it because it's, it's so beautiful to see what he was saying to them. To understand, I get to stand on God's word. Mark 10, 29. Mark 10, 29. Give me a few minutes. I promise you I'm out of here. Uh, you start at verse 27. Uh, the Bible says, And Jesus looked upon them and said, With men it is impossible with God, for, all, for with God all things are possible. So he's talking to them about learning how to live a life being financially blessed and prosperous. And so they were saying, God, who can be prosperous? And he says, with God, all things are possible. Uh, then Peter began to say unto him, lo, we have left all and followed you, Jesus. He says, I've given up everything that's a part of who I am just to follow you. There's going to be some times as you're walking out this word that God is going to call you to change things in your personality that you've had held on to since you were a child. And you're going to find yourself in prayer fussing at God. God, I've given up all for you. I've changed everything about who I am. The old me would have handled this totally different. I would have cussed him out. I would have went off. I would have wanted to slap somebody, God, but I'm changing everything because you told me to be an offering for you. And here's his response, and don't forget this. He says, verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left anything. He named some tangible stuff, but even when you leave the intangible in your personality, he says, you haven't left the house, brother and sister or father or mother or wife or children or land for my sake. And the gospel's sake. See, that's why you're doing this. Not for Winston's sake. You're doing it for the gospel's sake. He says, but he shall receive, receive a hundredfold now in this time. Oh, also, he shall receive also in the world to come eternal life. 
So he says, when I learn to shift my personality and become an offering, he says, blessings are easy to be unhoused because I'm walking out his word. There's nothing he can't do as long as I'm walking out his word. So as we're being prepared to be an offering, understand this. God's desire is to begin to shift your current reality to your desired destiny because of your obedience. Last scripture, I promise you, and then we're out of here. 1 Samuel 25. Just bear with me, I promise you. I'm, 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 I'm leaving. Fox, you can, you can play some music. Uh, we're getting ready to get out of here. 1 Samuel 25. You need to see what happens when you are made an offering versus just sowing an offering. Because we can give an offering, but it's so much better when we learn how to be an offering. That's what the Lord tells us. So the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel 25, we'll begin reading at verse number 2. We're about to be introduced to a woman by the name of Abigail. If you've never heard of her, I encourage you to read 1 Samuel 25 because this will revolutionize the way you think about what it means to be an offering and not just give an offering. Bible says there was a certain man, Maon, who carried on his business in the region of Carmel. He was prosperous. He had a plenty of stuff. The man's name was Nabal, which translates to food. I know some of you feel like you have some Nabals living with you or some Nabals who are cousins or some Nabals who are bosses, but this man's real name was food. So the Bible says his name was food and his wife's name was Abigail said the woman was intelligent. She was good looking, but the man was brutish and mean. Since David was there in the back country and he sent some of his men to Nabal to ask Nabal to provide for him some food for his men. So he was there with his men. He was looking for food and it says he was in the celebration season where extra food was available. So it's not like he had to do anything different to provide for David's need. All he had to do was send what David asked. The king is asking for something, and yet Nabal, the fool, says, Nah, I don't think so. I'm, I'm good. I don't even know this David. Uh, I, I, I don't even know what David has done for me. You read on down, David's men come back to him and tell him what Nabal says. The Bible says he told his men, Gird up! We're about to go, and we're going to kill everything related to Nabal's house. Him, his shearers, everybody is going to die. Says he took 400 men with him and left 200 there for the supplies. Way more than you would have if you were just shearing sheep during sheep shearing season. So Nabal's house is about to be destroyed. David was going to leave nothing. The Bible says, meanwhile, verse 14, a young shepherd happened to get this news into the ears of Abigail. Nabal's wife says David sent messengers uh, from the back country and Nabal insulted him and it says Abigail flew into action verse 18 says she took 200 loaves she got some breads two skins of wine five sheep dressed and ready for cooking a bushel of roasted grain hundred raisin cakes and a hundred of fig cakes she grabbed everything she could as fast as she could she grabbed an offering but she's going to be an offering to help save the lives of the people that she loves. Sometimes we have to be an offering. The Bible says she started to ride towards David, and she then presented it to David. It says, verse 23, as soon as she saw David, she got off her donkey, fell on her knees, and at his feet, her face to the ground, paying homage. She's face down on the ground, begging David, my master, let me take this blame. Let me speak to you. Listen to what I have to say. Don't dwell on what my brutish husband said. He acts out of the meaning of his name, Nabal, which means he's a fool. Foolishness oozes from him. Says, I wasn't there when, my, uh, when the young men came to my master, but now that I understand this, he says, uh, I hope that this offering helps to keep God from letting you avenge uh, and murder all of these people that you're on your way to do. Forgive my presumption, but God is at work in my master developing a rule solid and dependable. 
she goes on and she tells David how sorry she is and she breaks down exactly what her household is like that even though Nabal is prosperous he's a foolish man and she presents herself as an offering to David holy and acceptable bowed down on her face trying to get David to repent of what he wanted to do and the Bible says something so amazing it says that David then repented of the evil he had in his heart to do towards her he even told us that you saved the lives of all of the people of your house because I was coming to make spoils of them the Bible says that Abigail went home she didn't even go in and talk to Nabal about it she was he was drunk he was having a long night he was partying said the next day she went in and met with Nabal and told him what was about to happen and says God struck him with a stroke and within 10 days our buddy Nabal was no longer on this side of him the Bible then says that when David was anointed king one of the first actions he did was went back to Maon and found that woman who was an offering and made her his wife now, I'm not telling you that none of your spouses need to be dying after this message. But what I am saying is that if you learn how to be an offering, God is preparing to shift you from your current state to your desired destiny when we walk out his word. Standing all over the building. If you were blessed by the word, give God a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. We're going to pray now. Father, we thank you so much for your word, God. We pray now that it was received into the hearts and minds where it belongs, God. I pray now, God, that the word goes from just being information, God, something that we hear and we uh, just process in and out. God, but it becomes a form of meditation, something that we eat and chew on day in and day out, God, so that it becomes a part of our DNA. We begin to implement this word, God. We walk it out with obedience, God. We understand that, yes, in the natural, it's going to cause for inconvenience. God, but we thank you that you see and you know all, God. And you are ready to reward us for every time we agree to be an offering for you. God, we thank you now that we do all that we do for your glory, God and for our benefit. Let everything we do be done decent in order, God. Let us do it without complaining or murmuring, God, but do it with a heart and a mind that pleases you because we're ready, God, to see the destiny that you have promised that we can't even fathom. Daddy, we love you. We thank you for loving us beyond all imagination. For it is in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Go ahead and give God glory for the word tonight. Hallelujah. Come on, we can do better than that. Lord, prepare us to be an offering. God hears. So as we leave tonight, just keep in mind, what are we willing to sacrifice? or changing our lives in order to become the undeniable evidence of love. And whether that's at home or whether that's in the workplace, what are we willing to do tonight? Hallelujah. It's offering time. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We are expecting God to do some things in our lives. Hallelujah. Glory to God. If you're ready to give, we have four ways to give on tonight. So if you're at home online and you've been blessed by the word, go ahead and give that seed or that offering on tonight. Hallelujah. If you would go ahead and raise your offering unto the Lord, whether that's financially or even your heart. Hallelujah. And repeat after me. As I tithe faithfully and so continually, Lord, we thank you that increase is flowing into my life from multiple directions. Every stream of income you have ordained is flowing into my life. Streams of compensation, streams of investment, streams of inheritance, and stream of harvest. 
Therefore, I am blessed. My family's blessed. And my church family is blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give God praise for our time of giving. And as we leave on tonight, just ask God to help you with your love walk. And we will see you again on Sunday. Go in peace.